I had the good fortune of being born and raised here. Um, uh, spent all of my formative years on High Street. Um, grew up as a denizen of downtown um, and lived and breathed in every shop that was available downtown my whole childhood. Um, you know, spent all of my days in McCrory's. Um, uh, my first jobs were for people like Art Hawk at the Single Tree and Bob Ramsey at the Finishing Touch. Um, when I was 12 years old, Bob used to let me, you know, come and sweep up and take out trash. And uh, I worked my way through the, you know, pretty much everywhere downtown you could get a job. Um, worked for the Ironstone uh, Cafe with Kevin and Barbara. Um, when I was in high school, I, I worked my way all the way up to being the projectionist at the movie theater. And was, a, was one of the final projectionists in the days before that theater closed up. And it was, it was one of the great joys of my life to, to have seen that. Uh, sort of that, that sort of led me into the, in the film business as working there. Um, I, when I was 21 years old, um, I was about to invest my whole life into reopening the movie theater. The Chester Theater had just closed, the Prince Theater had just closed, and I was in talking with the owner and uh, cleaning up a lot of bat guano and trying to reopen it as a theater. And I was 21, I was re uh, at, the time, at the time I could have bought the building for about $250,000, which is extraordinary when you think of what you buy for that now. Um, and a good friend of mine who has been my neighbor my whole life, uh, and known me my whole life, and says, Bill, you've, you haven't seen anything yet. You should go out. You should do some other things because Chestertown will be here, and when you come back, we'll be ready for you. So that's what I did. I went out and I uh, went to school, and I traveled a while, um, took a lot of different jobs, have worked uh, for a minor league baseball operator, I've done a bunch of movies, um, taught school for a little while, and just, just try to gather as much information and experience from the world as I could until I was ready to come home. Um, because I knew that this was always home. And that this was where the world was going to need me and I would want to be needed the most. It's not that it's not pro-business. Um, it's just that it's not pro-business. It's, like it's not like they're actively turning things away. It's just that there's no receptor for it. There's no process for it. And there's no real... I mean, if you're coming to open a business in Chestertown, you wouldn't think to go to the county for your economic development help. You'd want to go to the town. And the town, as it stands right now, has no process for that. So that's where we have to start. You can't rely on just the county and what they offer because they're, frankly, dealing with a whole county. And Chestertown has to be the, the rising tide for the county. So that's a start. Um, you start by actually having an economic development plan, which we don't have. Um, if you look at other towns' websites like uh, Havre Grace or Easton or Cambridge, which are comparable towns, they're a little bigger, but they're comparable. Even Denton has business incentives and programs in place from the town that, you know, it doesn't have to be the town that offers the incentives, but it's going to be the town that's the conduit for them. And that's, I think, what the next job of the mayor is to do, is also to be a conduit. Uh, it has to be someone who's very savvy about the outside world and guides people. And I think I have a lot of acumen as far as that goes, as far as looking around and knowing what's going on. I spent a lot of time the last six months talking to people in the outside business community about what works where they are. Going to other small towns the size of ours and saying, well, why is yours working or why did this fail? You had a Main Street program two years ago. Why don't you have it now? You know, what changed? You're, you're swept into office and you want, you're going to do these two or three things right off the bat. Couple of political capital. It, it, provided I get swept into office with political capital to do so. And I have a council that is um, not completely resistant to change. Uh, uh, I think one of the first things I'd like to do is create a community development corp, which is called a CDC, which in a lot of places follows the Main Street model, except it's a little more broad sweeping. Um, the Main Street model for development, for those that don't know, is the National Heritage Program that helps a lot of downtowns and small communities do redevelopment and uh, business planning and you know, street sweep, all the, all the things that build up a downtown area. Uh, but their, their model is pretty limited to a specific number of blocks. With a CDC, we can apply that across the board of the town and trying to really develop what's wrong with the plaza. Why can't we get certain businesses in there and be proactive towards that? Because so goes the plaza, so goes downtown. Um, Chestertown downtown is terrific, but it doesn't operate in a bubble. And to think that it does is, you know, belying the fact that have, most of your local community doesn't shop downtown. So you need to be able to, but if most of the local community returns to shopping at the plaza, they're more apt to bring some of their business downtown. And some of those 
daily businesses are more apt to come downtown if the plaza businesses aren't vacant and, and, and waiting for things to fill them. So it's being a more holistic approach. I think we have a really great example of what's going with the college right now that there was finally some, some backlash for the college for the first time as long as I can remember, it, like legitimate beef with what's going on with the uh, old high school, the Board of Ed building, where something happened and the college made a deal and then that deal changed and then the checks and balances weren't there. The transparency wasn't there. And now after the fact, suddenly people realize, oh wait, that's not how that's going on. And we don't have a procedural guideline to really check that. And that's something we need. And this is the case where they, they they now want to tear it down. Exactly. Yeah. The, yeah. The, 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 well, ex ex sorry. Um, so, uh, in 2011, the college made a deal with the county board of education to purchase the board of education building on Washington Avenue. Um, it's an aging building in need of a lot of work, and the county didn't want to upkeep it anymore. The roof is in horrible shape, and it's, I, I'm pretty sure there's a good deal of asbestos in there now. If there's not, there was. Um, it's a, it's, the building needed tremendous repair that the county couldn't afford. So they made a deal with the college to buy the building so the college could utilize it. And it's in a great location for the college, frankly. It's, it's you know, on the cusp of their campus. It, it was a good fit as far as the sale goes. Part, contingent on that deal was a handshake deal that they would keep the western facade, which is the Washington Avenue facade, as, a, as, the, as it was so that historically it would look the same and they could build back into it as they wanted to. Retrofit the building, as it were. And down the line, the things got shaken out, and now the college has decided they will um, demo, demo that building and start all new. And, you know, I'm sure the new building will look lovely and be great. They've done a fine job with a lot of their buildings. But, you know, there wasn't really a recourse for a lot of people to realize, hey, this was where we went to high school. This is a historically significant building to the town. Um, and we're just now seeing that that transparency is an issue. Um, and that's, you know, some, someone, you know, I mean, I've... I heard about that plan months ago and realized that no one was throwing a flag at it. Um, and just now, I mean, we read now in the Kent News the last couple of weeks that you know, they're making a little bit of a hubbub about it. I, and I hope, I don't know what I hope happens with the building. I don't know what's in the best interest there. But I hope that as a result of this, uh, HDC, Historic District Commission, and the Planning Commission, and all those processes become a much more better process that people can understand how they work, so they don't understand so it's an arbitrary decision. Um, a lot of the things that I think people have issue with the town feel like it's because they're arbitrary or they don't really know from one to the next. Uh, in the historic district, I know I live in the historic district, I know that there's people that seem like they can get anything they want if they want to, and other people that, you know, can't get anything done. And I know that that's been a struggle for a lot of folks. And so you need a better sense of process, and that starts just by working with council and writing it. Uh, the, one of the biggest problems I've seen with our council in the last 20 years is that they're great public servants that are really good about helping people fix their problems. They're not particularly good legislators. They're not good at writing laws and ordinances that are easy to uh, follow up. Um, council is reticent to uh, make any fast moves, um, ever. Um, again, because I don't think they're legislators and they're, they're scared to write something wrong they leave it in, the, in, in uh, the capable hands of the town manager to sort of handle these things, and I think that's a mistake. Um, not leaving it in the hands of the town manager, but not taking responsibility for it. Um, the signed ordinance as written is old, dated uh, legislation that was not well written to begin with. Um, it's not anti-business, it's just sluggish and not up to date. And sluggish and up, not up to date is anti-business in the modern era. Um, I don't think that uh, you need to hinge everything on whether the Garfield Center needs an LED sign to fix what else is wrong with the sign ordinance. Um, the problem is, is that it's not very equitably applied across the whole town, and uh, the historic district has an entirely different set of standards, um, which is fine. And I, I, I condone that the historic district should have a set of standards, but we need to have a better understanding of what works and what doesn't work. And there's no real looking at other towns and see what works for them. One of the things I've noticed about Chestertown is that our signage and our, a lot of what we've done have done has been piecemeal over the course of years, including the town signs. Quite frankly, uh, the, even even the official signs of the town are sort of done whenever we get them with no real sense of the, what the last set was done, and that sense of design, an element that really makes sense, is a huge impact on being pro-business. Um, when you go into a, a small town, and things look like they fit and belong. 
you realize they've got it together and there's something worth looking at here. If you go into a small town and things are just old and new and slapdash and, and one is neon and one is the other, then you realize no one's really caring and it's all being done however you want to do it. So that's really I see the sign ordinance as, as two big issues. One, it needs to be rewritten to be updated. Um, it needs to be done in a way that's, that's in, with the modern sense of what business should be and what, what's applicable. And, and with the businesses in mind, you need to talk to them what they want, with some decorum. You, no one needs a 25-foot flashing neon sign in front of any business. We just don't need that. It, you, it's not, that's not going to change your business. Um, but you also need some sense of design element. And so, you know, in this, I mean, when, when they, you open a shopping plaza, everybody gets the same, you know, style of sign because it makes the plaza look, you know, some uniformity makes it look like everything belongs there. Um, and downtowns and whole towns can do that. You don't have, everyone has to have a green and white sign with white letters. But you can do things in a way that is conducive to looking like it's a unified uh, piece. And I think that's what we can do. Funny, right, here's a good example of what's wrong with the budget. Um, the rec commission has no say in it, and we don't even get a look at it. If, we, if I hadn't been at that meeting that it was approved and asked for a line item of it, it's not even line itemed in the budget. It's sort of like, well, we've got some money, we'll just throw it in. And then, the, and then a, a perfect example is last, this year, I w I've asked for two line items for the rec commission. We asked for some money to show movies in the park, we asked for some money to, sh to start the bocce league. Both very successful programs. But they were just sort of added in. And this is, there's a lot of loosey-goosiness to the budget that I would like to see reformed. I know that uh, that is one of uh, Councilwoman Kuyper's um, major uh, problems. And one of the reasons she got involved in the process to begin with is that there's this sort of this, we don't know where it's going and we don't know where it's coming from. Um, I think there's a lot to be said about going line by line and, and showing the accountability for every, every budget. And, and, and starting the beginning of the year saying, these are the projects we're doing. And saying, this is what we can work with. Um, and not being quite so broad-termed with everything. So moving on.